There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Well, I lugged my portable lawn chair. I'm just not feeling so portable the second time I drug, I dragged it out um, to a new park, new to you. I scoped it out a few weeks ago, and this is my first time. This one's actually the second closest natural spot I can go to, and here I am. If the sun does come out or the sun moves, I will. Um, I've got my lawn <laughs> chair, but. Shoulder's a little sore. I need a caddy. I need, a, I need an assistant. <laughs> anyway, so I'm gonna get. Well, a lot of this is gonna be serious. Light moments help uh, help one digest the serious. But let's get serious for a minute. I have really good news. The indigenous writer Don Dumont, also known as Don Walker, was located and her child, her seven-year-old son, safe and sound, somewhat confusingly, in Oregon which is quite far from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And that's all I know, but they are safe. So that's a huge relief. And the, the media is speculating. I'm not gonna speculate on what the media is making a lot about the fact that apparently they entered the US illegal, illegally. Well, um, that's bullshit. Indigenous people shouldn't need passports on Turtle Island. So let's just dispense with that nonsense. But, um, what was, what, why, what, I don't know. I'm not gonna speculate. I just wanna read actually, this is my, gonna be my final word on the subject, maybe forever, but certainly until more news comes to light. Don DeMont is the CEO of the Federation of Status Indians. I believe that's what F-S-I-N stands for. I didn't write it down. Because I don't have pocket Wi-Fi anymore, I have to make notes. And I didn't think to look that up. So FSIN, I believe it's the Federation of Status Indians. And the vice chief of that organization put out a statement after Dawn DeMont and her son had been located. They are in the process of getting back home. At FSIN, we know why First Nations women go missing and recognize that there are many complex issues that surround their disappearances. This is clearly the case with Dawn and her son Vinny, and we will be closely following the legal process with more details on this case eventually being made public. And that was their statement, and I agree with every word of that. But the good news is they are safe and sound. All right. I went to a Asian grocery store that had a lot of Japanese stuff, so I got some canned coffee. And this is my first time to try it. I haven't tried one yet. I got about five cans and they're, you know, $2, 250 compared to a buck in Tokyo, but still not bad. So let's see if it's any good. I don't think I've ever tried this particular brand. UCC is a famous coffee brand in, in Japan, but I don't think I've ever, let's see. Oh yes, takes me right back, as the Japanese say, Natsukashi, which means I'm feeling nostalgic. I'll be drinking these with, for the next few Friday reads. Or Saturday reads, which this is. Yesterday was cold and I decided I'm not gonna go out in the cold and I'm not gonna film inside. I'm gonna take an extra day and finish some stuff up. So I have lots to tell you about. I'm filming much later in the, in the morning. It's actually almost lunchtime. It's 10 to 12 because it's just too cold at 7 a.m. So, oh, I, while I'm thinking of it, I want to clear up one thing that one uh, commenter said recently. When I film here, it's obvious I'm in a city park, I think. But when I film out back behind me in the golf course kind of park area there, it's so wild. It's so, there's so much nature. You can't really see any hint of civilization. Um, and so the commenter said, I don't know how you can live in the countryside like that with no people around or no houses or something. And it's like, oh, I guess you could get that if you're just kind of dropping in and haven't been following along, that that would, that would be an understandable misunderstanding. So no, I do live in the city and I just happen to live, luckily, at the edge of this huge golf course and, and park. But I'm actually in a city park today. 
The other thing that I wanted to bring to your attention is this is Women in Translation Month. I don't think many of you needed me to bring your attention to that, but you should be following the wonderful channel that is co-hosted, co-created co by the preeminent, uh, lovely, vivacious, and just downright wonderful literary translator, Tina Cover, who is a friend of mine. And uh, I've, I always forget the name of the other uh, person that she does it with. Maybe she'll put that in a comment below because um, that, that person is also a preeminent translator who I'm sure is very, has lots of women whimsy and pizzazz too, but I, I don't know her. So the point of the channel is, I think you can kind of get it from the title, Translators Aloud, that translators read their translations, short, short readings of from their translations. And in August, every day, so you're gonna need to go back it's on August 1st and catch up, and then keep going throughout the month, they are featuring um, translations of women writers. So check that out, I'll put a link in the show notes. I don't really have any other personal news. I've just been continuing to veg and read and nap. So doing one practical task, like, you know, looking at the job, looking at the help wanted section of the, something online or doing something to do with immigration and stuff, but still just really kind of being a, whatever the literary, whatever the bookish equivalent of being a couch potato is. Does, can we come up with a term? Um, I guess couch potato, but I always envision someone watching TV, which I don't do. Oh my God, that's disgusting. All right, I have one bale, finished two, and how many have I started? I believe I've started five. I think that's right. So one bale, finished two, started five. Actually started six, but that's one of the ones I finished. So enough with the the mathematical calculation component of this broadcast. Uh, let me start, obviously, with the bale. This was a bit of a disappointment. Oh, the weather is gorgeous. I might be a little bit dark and I don't care. I'm usually so pale that I'll give you a break from my whiteness. Lord knows we all need a break from our whiteness. My bale is How the One-Armed Sister Sweeps Her House by Sherry Jones, the Barbadian novel started out really good. I got to 60% and decided I didn't give a shit about anything going on and I bailed. I also am reminded that I had a similar reaction to that trilogy of novels from Zimbabwe. The first one was... Oh boy. Uh, Nervous Conditions is the first one. C.C. Uh, uh, Dangaramba, I think I've got the author right. And over a 20 or 25 year span she wrote a trilogy of novels with the same uh, following a protagonist and nervous conditions i thought was pretty good like it was a four star read and then the next two i just absolutely hated i couldn't finish the third one which came out quite recently and, and it was nominated for a woman's prize and a lot of people out there agree with me that it's one of the worst books i've ever tried to read the second and the third in that series but there's also a lot of really smart readers who disagree and say that it's a wonderful depiction of the hopelessness of people, of victims of colonization. So uh, I've always thought someday, but probably not for at least 25 years, <laughs> I might try it again. But this, my reaction to this book was quite similar, but not quite as um, dramatic. I didn't like the characters. I didn't care. They were, they were so hopeless. It was dark and there was no, I knew there was not going to be any happiness. And even if I'm wrong, uh, I certainly didn't think there was, and I would still wouldn't regret bailing. The writing was fine. Just okay. The atmosphere was pretty good, but I just don't really like like there's gotta be something. It doesn't have to be in the story and it doesn't have to be in the character. Maybe it's in the writing that I have to feel a sense of hope. And is, is that, am I speaking from privilege? Probably, I can only react the way I react, right? I can still be maybe a little bit educable at this stage of my life, but when there's absolutely nothing, characters are pretty awful. The outlook, it's so bleak and the writing is not kind of get adding anything to it, I just lose interest. And that's what happened with this. So the audiobook was 
quite lovely. And, and the other interesting thing about this was I found at a certain point a couple days ago that I could just put the book down because I, I, I'm a firm, I believe, just listening to an audiobook, and I'm only talking about myself, not anybody out there who's watching, but it's not enough just to do a book on audio, almost never. I, want, I need to have the text and do them together, page by page, sentence by sentence, listening and reading at the same time. I call it the audio text combo. And so that's what I was doing, but I realized at a certain point a couple days ago that I didn't need to be following along and that I could have it playing and I could stay focused on it, maybe not 100%, but you know, 92% and do housework and do that, do, 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 do this, that, the other thing, fold laundry or whatever. Yeah, write me fold laundry. <laughs> but, um, and, and I realized now in retrospect, that was actually a sign of that I was starting to to detach and lose interest in it and I just wanted to motor through and again other people uh, and even me I can think of one or two books where I only had the audio and it was a profound experience but usually the the profundity comes when the two are for me when the two are done in tandem and so for me to break away and say oh I don't need the book was because the, you know there was nothing that great about it so it was only shortly thereafter that I bailed it's noon on Saturday and it's a pretty warm day, but there isn't a, there was a, a mother and a young kid here when I first started, but I thought this place would be teeming with tots, but lucky me, it's very quiet. And I finished two. One of them, which is what I'm gonna talk about first, is a book that because I bailed, I thought, you know, I could sneak in a tiny, a small novella women in translation and it wasn't on my tbr now that all my so many of my books i'd say 70 percent of my books are here now from tokyo so i just went it was just a joyful experience perusing my shelves and finding a little book that would fit the bill and that is proleturka by fleur jaggy a swiss writer who writes in italian and this was translated from the Italian by Alistair McEwen, a translator I'm not familiar with, but it's probably because I don't read a lot of Italian stuff. And this was a five-star read for me, and I'd, I'd never really, I mean, I'd heard the name Fleur Jaggi, but I didn't know where she was from. I knew she was European, but beyond that, I didn't realize that Danish, I'm not sure. But I bought the book, and there it was on my shelf, and I loved it. I loved it. In the, sen in the sense that it wasn't really a Sean book and I didn't feel emotionally connected to the characters, which is what a Sean book gives me, but that that was actually the topic of the book, the lack of affect and uh, inability to express or feel really anything at all, certainly about one's immediate family members. And that was so fascinating that despite not getting what I usually need to get from a book for it to be a five-star read, instead what I got was this deep fascination with what was happening on the page, the writing slash translation. It's just wonderful and it also wouldn't be for everybody. And there's a part of me that's surprised that it's for me. There is a sparseness and a remoteness and a, and a just icy cold but beguiling weirdness to the prose. That was what kept me going. The writing was so strange and wonderful and it vaguely reminded me of other writers, some of whom I liked, some of whom I didn't. What's the name of the Romanian German writer that won the Nobel? Again, in Tokyo, I didn't need to prepare like this. I could just Google my way to bring stuff up and I can't do that, so. Uh, you know who I mean? Here is the book that I tried to read of hers and I couldn't make head nor tail of. And here is the novella that I did read and didn't understand anything I read. So, um, Fleur Daggy's writing was vaguely reminiscent of it, but much more accessible. The other uh, writer, I believe he's a Spanish writer, and he wrote Such Small Hands, a novella that I read and did a buddy read with the fabulous booktuber from Ireland who has just changed her channel name and I can't remember the details so they'll be typed below 
but she and I buddy read this such small hands together and there was something psychologically alluring that came through in an enigmatic prose style or it's pro prose translation this also vaguely reminiscent of that so the protagonist who I don't think is well, never named she's 15 and she's going on a cruise maybe just after World War II decades later she's reflecting on all this this was published around the year 2000 as a 15 year old she goes on a cruise and the ship is named Proleturka proletarian girl it's a Yugoslavian ship but they are Swiss and she's uh, she's going on this cruise with her her father Johannes and they barely have any relationship at all her parents were divorced and she was raised pretty much exclusively by a forbidding grandmother who controlled uh, on the mother's side who controlled Johannes her father's access to her to the max she barely let her the father see the kid at all but at the age of 15 she goes on this cruise with him and there's a part of her that's yearning to kind of connect and get to know him but the deepest part of her would rather do anything else but get to know her father and he himself is a very withdrawn kind of stiff upper lip man so there's um, it's not a spoiler to say that there's almost no communication between them there's so much alike that they they spend time together without speaking in fact they really spend almost the whole time on the ship together when they're alone they, they don't speak other than the rudiments of you know shall we go to shall we go to dinner or something and meanwhile she's got this rich inner life but rich in this emotionally detached way and she starts to experiment with sexuality she loses her virginity with one of the ship what do they call them uh, officers and in fact then starts to go through the whole, the whole uh, list of employees on the ship one of the ways that the remoteness and the disconnection from other people comes through is that she this first person narrative about four times at each page slips into third person and it's just sometimes in the same sentence and it's done so well and it has such an effect on, it had such an effect on me it kept me kind of destabilized and just wondering huh what 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 and also that she only rarely refers to Johannes as her father and mostly just Johannes and the same with her mother I'm gonna read you a paragraph about the mother she didn't grow up with the mother after they divorced she was raised very strictly by this grandmother her, her mother was a I think she might have been a professional pianist but she certainly was an incredibly talented pianist and it was because Johann's mother overheard her playing walking by their estate that the match was made between them but anyway that's all this woman had going for her apparently uh, our protagonist's mother so here is a paragraph about this and again notice how it starts Johannes's wife my mother used to play the piano when I was invited to stay with her, I would listen to her for hours. Perhaps this is why I'm attracted to the sound of the piano. Like the unknown woman in the tract, if I hear the sound of a piano, I follow it. The sound of the piano represents all that I have not had. I used to hear it playing when I was very small, when she was still married to Johannes. Then that sound ceased. The rooms fell silent. I hated that silence without realizing it. The silence received from a man and a woman who were leaving each other and who had disposed of their daughter's life absolutely. To this day, when I listen to the piano, I am seized by a violent emotion. I do not know what it is, but my mind goes back towards something beautiful, distant, destroyed. Simply because Johannes' wife, my mother, deceived me. By playing the piano, she spoiled my feeling for music. So that actually adds some nuance to what i said that there's no emotion in the story so the emotion comes out sideways it comes out in this kind of a uh, passage but it also comes out in the way that she views um all furniture as being having being animated and containing a lot of emotion so there's so much projection and stuff going on and it's so beautifully written and i think i'll stop talking about it there but i was blown away by Proleturka by Fleur Jaggi, translated from the Italian by Alistair McEwen. Wasn't on my Women in Translation Month TBR. Glad that I snuck it in anyways. Oh dear, I'm probably getting the beginning of a sunburn on the back of my head, so I'm just gonna move 
down to the shadier spot. I think that would be... There, now you've got that ugly garbage can in the background, but my head will not be getting burnt at the back, so that's how it's gonna be. I would like to introduce a quote from one of my favorite writers, whose third work of fiction I have started and I'll be talking about later today. This is from A Constellation of Vital Phenomena, which is one of my favorite novels of all time. And in fact, I just quoted it when I had a bite-sized book chat with Nancy about the latest novel. This question is what animates most of the books that are Sean books that I love. If, uh, probably any of the top five or ten books of my reading life address this question. One of them being the book that this quote came from, and here it is. What did any one person matter when pounded against the anvil of history? And I thought about that quote as I started, as I began reflecting on this week's reading, what I'd finished and what I'd started, because almost all of them seem to be addressing that question, the, the individual against historical forces, and uh, usually of an oppressive nature. Four lovely kids just arrived with their mom, so there's going to be some chattering in the background, but I don't think it'll be too... I, mean, I am doing this right beside a playground, so, you know, them the, them the breaks. The other book I finished is also a Woman in Translation book, but I started it in May, um, but I finished it at the beginning of Women in Translation Month, and that is Natasha Woden's memoir. She came from Mariupol, translated from the German by Alfred Coopers. Oh my god. This was an unbearably heartbreaking, incredibly important book, one of the best memoirs I have ever read. And uh, I don't know that anybody else on Booktube has ever talked about it, so I'm going to talk about it at length, and I'm already looking at how much time I've been talking, so the rest of it you're going to get short, short little snippets about, but this one I have to talk about it. Natasha Woden is a German writer who was born in Germany in 1945 to uh, Ukrainian parents born in a slave labor camp in Germany and then the war ended later that year and then they became displaced persons but their lifestyle of living in a displaced persons camp under the allied Americans and whatnot was not much better and her mother committed suicide when she was about 10 or 11 and by which point that they were living in their own home that was uh, that was a lot nicer than where they had started out from in Germany dealing with a lot of racism and uh, prejudice uh, from Germans and she didn't know very much about her mother's background. She remembered a few things her mother told her and she didn't have very much to go on. She knew that she was born in Mariupol, Ukraine um, in the early years after the, the revolution, the Russian Bolshevik revolution, but she didn't know very much. In recent years, she would be in her late 70s, so maybe in her early 70s, I'm not, I'm not sure when, but certainly well into the internet era, she decided to do some genealogical research and very quickly started to put the pieces together. The first, I would say half or third of this is a kind of blow by blow account of the various pieces of the puzzle coming together. And especially if you're interested in, in family secrets and genealogy you will find fascinating. I think pretty much any reader of nonfiction would find it fascinating. The writing is wonderful and the story of this family is so wild. She assumed that her mother came from lower class because of how, where she ended up doing slave labor in, in uh, Germany and she quickly found out and I'm not going to give very many spoilers but uh, this happens quite early in the book that uh, she finds out that actually, no, she came from formerly very well-to-do upper-class Ukrainian hyphen Italian family. I believe the author Natasha Woden's grandmother was um, Italian. And they were a very prominent family in Mariupol who quickly uh, were disabused of and stripped of almost all of their privileges in the early days of the Bolshevik Revolution. She finds out about aunts and an uncle and locates a couple cousins or distant, more distant relatives. She finds things online and one of the things she finds is her aunt's 
memoir that was never published. Then the middle third, I think, is uh, Natasha Wooden retelling in her own words, and I don't know how much fictionalizing, it doesn't read as if she fictionalized anything. She's retelling what was in Aunt Lydia's memoir, I guess actually, maybe it was journals, I don't think, I read it more as, as, as a memoir, but anyway. And that was even more fascinating. So you get Lydia's life story. She was an older sister of the mother and her life was just, she was in, just, uh, she became an anti-Bolshevik activist and she got arrested and sent to Siberia and then she got married and blah, 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 all this stuff. Unbelievable life, tragic, with all kinds of tragedy and, and horrific stuff. And then the fourth part of the, uh, the fourth part of she came from Mariupol is now that she has all this context that she never that she hadn't had before Natasha Woden tells the story of her parents and what she had always known about them um, and their terrible wretched lives as slave laborers in uh, Germany and then displaced persons in incredibly unhappy marriage and the fact that her mother was a broken person from all of this trauma and um, the, the anvil of history really pounded her down to she was uh, had terrible mental illnesses and eventually took her own life. And that story is is a heartbreaking conclusion. So this is not for the faint of heart. It is such a Sean book. It's so gorgeously written. As, as far as I understand, it's the only thing that has been translated so far by me, Natasha Wooden, who is a novelist. She was married to. Wolfgang Hilbig at one point, but that's why he should be famous, is what, what I think. And has written a pile of novels and maybe other memoirs, and I hope they all get translated because this, especially to read it in the more recent context of what's of Mariupol being completely leveled by Putin, and it was completely leveled by the Nazis. So Mariupol has just been destroyed and rebuilt so many times and there's quite a bit about Ukrainian identity and Ukrainian stuff that really has a direct bearing on the present but mostly well, the deepest part of this is what does any one life matter when pounded against the anvil of history absolutely a, a delight of the darkest kind this hey well I know the lighting is not great but I have deleted the rest of this video because I blathered on for another 15 20 minutes and who's got time for that I certainly don't have time to edit it so I'm gonna finish this sucker in three minutes or less I will be aided by a my new cocktail that I'm experimenting with rum and coconut water I'd never heard of coconut water it's rather tasty these lovely drinking glasses I got in Japan just before I left, but no more digression, Sean. You're just gonna get 10 seconds each on all the other books I started and whatnot. My responses are all positive, so <laughs> I'm gonna go this fast. I have started Disoriental by Nagar Javadi, translated by my friend Tina Cover. Loving it so far. Ditto for this one, which slipped my mind during this quick redo of the ending. Same with The Silken Thread, short stories by Cora Sandell, translated from the Norwegian by Elizabeth Rokan, starting out really great, especially one story that either was the, the germ of the idea of the Alberta Trilogy or just a, something she pulled out of the final version of the novel, one of the novels, that just <coughs> got to me. The Last Brother by Nathacha Apana, gorgeously written, translated from the French by Geoffrey Strawn. Uh, gorgeous writing, that's all I can say so far. That's all I have time to say. And Mercury Pictures presents the new Anthony Amara novel. I'm really liking it so far. I watched Greg's video just far enough where he started to say that he didn't like it after the opening, and I stopped watching because I don't want to be, I don't want to hear any more about his opinion, especially if it's negative, until I have finished the book myself. But I also see that he's doing it on audio, and I rejected the audio book because I didn't care for the audio narration at all on the free preview, so I'm just reading it. What am I starting? The latest Louise Erdrich novel, The Sentence, because the audiobook I requested from Libby came in, so I'm going to do that as an audio text combo. And the forthcoming memoir coming out next month by the lovely Ellen Cassidy, who's an author of quite a few nonfiction books and memoir, but also a 
translator of Yiddish literature into English, and I had her on as a guest on my channel. I think it was for Women in Translation Month last year. I will put a link to that lovely chat in the show notes. But this is her forthcoming memoir about her feminist union organizing in I think the 70s for women in an office that were being harassed, sexually harassed and everything. They, they banded together and it was became the beginning of this big labor union and it was the inspiration, I kid you not, of the movie Nine to Five. It's, it's about all of that and the foreword is written by Jane Fonda. I'm reading it because I'm going to be interviewing Ellen Cassidy on this channel just before launch date. That's all I have time to say. Thanks for, sorry I went on so long. Thanks for watching.